Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Maradian here for the, at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. at the conclusion of a discussion on Navy maintenance. Uh, that's part of a maritime dialogue series that's put together by the uh, CSIS as well as the Naval Institute. And we're honored to have with us uh, the speaker, uh, featured speaker at uh, uh, this uh, panel uh, discussion this morning, who is the man who's in charge of the Naval Sea Systems Command at uh, Vice Admiral Tom Moore, the man who makes the Navy run. Sir, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Vago. Thanks for that introduction. Good to see you again. Uh, great seeing you. So uh, yesterday your band played, and then something else interesting happened that you announced to the to yeah, the crowd. Yeah, the, uh, the other thing that happened last night, in addition to the band playing, is we delivered the Ford to the Navy. So a uh, very big day for a lot of the people uh, that have worked on that program for the last 10 to 15 years, not only on the government side, but in the industry as well. And so it's a big day. I, I got a chance to ride the ship. Last week for three days for the acceptance trials, it's a it's a fantastic ship. Had a great time out there for three days. Uh, there's nothing like running around at uh, 35 uh, knots, 40, 40 plus miles an hour at 87,000 tons and doing high speed turns and uh, you're like a little kid out there. So it was uh, ship performed superbly, and uh, we'll, she's back in port in Norfolk, and uh, we're getting ready to commission her, and then uh, off we go. A lot of testing to go on the ship. Um, you had promised that you would do this by uh, uh, May 31. Uh, you got it done on May 31 uh, uh, before midnight. Uh, uh, tell us what are some of the next challenges you've got to iron out uh, as you try to bring the ship into service. So uh, now, uh, after get the ship commissioned, the big next big event is to go get the flight deck certified and go start launching and recovering aircraft on the pl on the carrier, which is obviously why we built it. So that will happen in August, and uh, we'll start out uh, with uh, with Super Hornets, and it'll give us a chance to go uh, not only uh, let EMALS and AAG test those out and put them in an operational environment, but it'll also give the crew a chance to go. Uh, use the flight deck, which was designed uh, to specifically increase sortie generation rate by, you know, an improved layout of the flight deck. So this is a, a good opportunity for us to get out and test it out. And then throughout the fall, uh, the ship will be underway quite a bit between now when she goes into her post-shake down availability in March of 2018 with a series of events that will, a lot of it focused on the flight deck, but a lot of uh, stuff associated with the dual band radar and the combat system as well. And so she's got a pretty uh, aggressive schedule between now and the PSA that we'll bring her in for post-shake down availability for about eight, uh, eight to ten months. There's some modernization we have to do, some other things we want to finish up on the ship. And then when she comes out of post-shake down availability, she is, uh, you know, she will be working pretty hard to get through all the tests and evaluation that's mandated for her before we uh, get her to a shock test and then on to deployment. Uh, I want to ask you about a whole bunch of uh, things about the ship, uh, but I want to take you to the budget, which I think is uh, something that is pressing on everybody's mind. You were looking for a significant amount of money, significant amount of money to rebuild the Navy's uh, maintenance infrastructure, hire those people, shortage of nuclear skills trades, for example, being one of those challenges, uh, as well as doing the military construction, uh, capital investment in equipment, more than a billion dollars you wanted to do on that front. How is this budget doing? Is this budget going to give you the tools? the funds necessary to rebuild that 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 uh, maintenance backlog that you guys have built up. Yeah, so uh, the maintenance, the budget in, for in fiscal year 18 is really uh, very pleased with where we came out on the maintenance side of the house. 100% of the requirement was funded. Uh, if you heard the vice, you say the first dollar is going to go to readiness. It did. And so we've got an opportunity now to go higher up in the naval shipyards uh, over the next couple of years and get up to the 36,100 end strength that I need to be at, and I'll be there probably end of fiscal year 19, early 20, and that will give me the ability to go get the work done that I need to get done. <clears throat> that the growth will allow me to kind of stop the growth of the backlog. I won't start working that off till I get to 36,000, but I will stop growing the backlog now, and I'll start working that off. So I'm satisfied that the, the Navy's made the, the right decision and there's a lot of money going into the budget. Now it's our, term to our uh, time to deliver. On the uh, investment side of the house, uh, we made a good, uh, I think, a down payment on the investments. So we've made some investments in the shipyards to improve the facilities, uh, some money uh, for dry dock improvements. Um, as I talked about in the discussion in there, long term, um, more is needed. And uh, that's an ongoing discussion that I'm having with Navy leadership in terms of what investments need to be made in the facilities and in the people to make them more productive. So long term, the, the maintenance budgets don't have to be at the high state that they're at today. Um, one of the things uh, that folks are, uh, the challenge, the question that some have been asking is, look, by taking this readiness gap before 
investing in building new ships, that makes it harder for you to get to 355. And there you made the case, and I want you to sort of fill that out a little bit for us, is how you guys meaningfully, NAFC contributes by getting ships out to the fleet faster to be able to increase that number. What's the case you're making for that? Yeah, I, the case I'm making is uh, we clearly have to build more ships to get to 355, but uh, you, you can take the ships that you currently have and you can, if you do the right maintenance and modernization, you can keep them longer than we're planning to keep them today. And that uh, you could, with a relatively small investment, uh, you could keep a sizable portion of the fleet that's out there today for five, ten years longer than they're being kept today. And that would dramatically increase the size of the force a lot faster than you could do by getting there just by building new ships. So I think it's 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 not an either or. Uh, you got to do both. And so uh, I'm pleased, and I think the strategy that we're on right now gives us the opportunity to kind of go do that going forward. And and that the maintenance piece of this will actually be a major contributor to force size and not not a something that's taking resources away from the size of the force. Have you investigated what's in the mothball fleet and what you think can be resuscitated quickly and get it back to the force? Yeah, we've looked at everything. Um, there's not a lot in the uh, inactive force there. There are some ships uh, that we think we can bring back. Um, Cruisers. There's, um, well, uh, there's only right now CG 4748, uh, 51. Most of those uh, ships uh, are pretty, from a combat system standpoint, are pretty obsolete and probably wouldn't bring them back. And they've kind of been spare parts lockers, if you will, for the last couple of years. Uh, you know, we'll go look at uh, the FFGs, if there's utility there. We'll go look at some of the combat logistics force ships that are there. Um, you know, probably the carriers that are in, in active status right now, Kitty Hawks, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the one that's, that uh, you could think about, but we really studied that before when we were, when we were decommissioned Enterprise. And so the carriers are pretty old. And uh, so I think that there's limited opportunity in the inactive fleet to bring those back. Uh, but we're going to go look at that ship by ship and, and uh Put that into the mix. Let me ask you uh, about uh, the frigate study. Uh, you mentioned frigates. There's uh, the Navy is studying what capabilities it wants its future frigates to be as part of this whole mix. Whether there are foreign designs, whether the LCS frigatized version is the right answer for the Navy. Ultimately, bring us up to speed on where that study is right now. Well, it's still uh, an internal Navy study, and uh, we're looking pretty hard at the alternatives and what is it that the requirement is going to be for this platform. I think that's the key. In any, when you buy any ship, is what is it exactly you want this ship to do? So we're looking pretty hard at what that requirement set is, and then that requirement set will then drive you know what the competition looks like and what we would consider. I think uh, you know we certainly are open to competition and looking at a wide variety of of options, including you know some of the uh, foreign uh, design ships, a national security cutter. Um, you know, a new design, LCS, I think those things are all on the table, but uh, we haven't finished the complete review and got reached complete agreement on it. Is it, what exactly is it we want this thing to do, and that's going to be really key to the next step. If you got to get that step right uh, in, in order to proceed on to the part where you can put a RFP out to industry and go have them start bid and build something. Um, let me ask you, I know, I know your time is short, so I'll keep, uh, keep this moving. Um, Columbia, uh, scheduled for the new SSBNs, uh, new ballistic missile submarines. Navy's been working on this program for some time. UK is a key partner on it. Uh, but this schedule has virtually zero elasticity on it. It's, it's 14 years, assuming nothing goes wrong, yeah. for you to make first uh, deployment in 2031. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you're going to build some margin, get some margin, win some margin back on something that has just got to be Swiss watch style going through the process. Well, so there is some margin in the schedule, but it's it's not, uh, I'm never comfortable with the margin I have. So we're working pretty hard today across the board to, tr to try and build more margin into the schedule than we have uh, today. We're, we're building a very, you know, a consolidated test facility up in uh, Philadelphia that will allow us to kind of go test some of the major components out ahead of put it on the ship that's kind of a lessons learned uh, from pr previous ship classes where we have the opportunity to do that. And uh, it's the Navy's number one and the department's number one priority. So it's uh, it's getting full attention and we're looking across the board with industry on you know how do we accelerate some of the, the things that we need to do in terms of material procurement and, and testing. And, and you know, then we gotta get the ship on a contract.
Uh, you mentioned something. There are so many things I want to talk to you about, but I know you've got to go. Uh, you mentioned dry docks, and I want to some, at some point talk to you a little bit about that, the 3 to $4 billion in dry docks, uh, the Ford class. Let me ask you about that. Ford class it requires different power, 13.8 mm -hmm. uh, kV, uh, different sorts of cooling. You're going to have Virginia payload module in the Virginia is much longer than the, the docks we've got. Some of the docks we've got are all optimized for, for 688s or even younger, uh, you know, 637, some of the, some of the, some of the older docks. Um, talk to us a little bit about what kind of investment is going to be needed force-wide because wherever these ships end up, you've got to be able yeah. to service them. So we're looking at all four shipyards, and we're looking at when when do the ships come online, so that we don't <clears throat> you know we make the we don't make the investment ahead of need. Um, so there's a base amount of work that you have to do on these dry docks to maintain them in a certification status. So you've got to do that, and then we're looking at where will you know where the where will the VPM ships go first, and so you know we'll prioritize those shipyards to extend those dry docks out. And where are the Ford class carriers going first? So Norfolk will get the first investment in her dry dock to handle a Ford class carrier that's in the budget. Um, you know, Kennedy's the next ship. She doesn't deliver till you know 2024 time frame. Not likely to get out to Puget till if she goes to the West Coast till you know 27, 28. So we've got a little bit of time there. But uh, you know, I think we know what we need, and we've got a pretty good phased plan that's based on uh, when the ships get delivered and. I think uh, I don't see any question that we're going to go make the investments that we need to make on the, on the dry deck side of the house. Last question, any determination on Enterprise's fate yet as to where she's going to be uh, uh, scrapped? No. Uh, she's going to stay for the time being at Newport New Shipbuilding uh, until we've made a final decision. Admiral, thanks <laughs> very much. It's always a pleasure. All right, thanks. Great to see you as always. Thank you.